Hey guys, <clears throat> so this video is going to go over my absolute most favorite type of macromolecule, which would be nucleic acids. After all, I am a molecular biologist, so this is what it's all about for me. This is what makes me really excited. So, let's jump right in. So, so far, all of the macromolecules that we have talked about are involved in doing things like you know, giving us energy in some form or fashion, either quick burst energy or slow release energy, or helping us to form cell membranes, or helping to transport things, or helping to speed up reactions. But the macromolecule that is most responsible for each individual that you will ever encounter or ever see would be our nucleic acids. This is where information is stored. So it's all about storing our code. It's all about storing our essence, in a sense. So, what's the function of nucleic acids? That is where our genetic material is found, and it does two main things. It can both store this genetic material, and it can also transfer our genetic material. So, storing information and transferring information. It stores the genetic material in the form of genes. And genes are pretty much all the instructions that you need for building proteins, so all the instructions necessary for life. Genes are for, found in the form of DNA. DNA can be transcribed, and tra transcribed into RNA, sorry, and RNA can be translated into proteins. Nucleic acids also transfer information. This is where new body cells get their information from. That's why we can take DNA from a cheek cell or from blood cells or from cells found on on the ends of your hair and they will all have the same genetic code because they all came from the same person. Um, DNA also is the blueprint for our next generation. When we reproduce, half of the DNA that we have combines with half of the DNA from our partner and we form new life. I just absolutely love this picture because to me this kind of brings it all together. So here we have our classic double helix showing our four bases of DNA. When we take that double helix and we twist it and we wind it on itself, we create a chromosome. So the entire thing is a chromosome. These little sections are all genes, all of them of varying lengths and all of them coding for different proteins, proteins that do different functions. Your chromosomes are going to be found within the nucleus of your cell. This is pretty much where life starts for us. <clears throat> so there are two main kinds of nucleic acids, or there are only two kinds, really, of nucleic acids, and they are RNA and DNA. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid, and it's a single helix, so it's just like a, a ribbon, whereas DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and it is a double helix. I always told my freshmen that names are powerful in science because they give you information. So the first part of ribonucleic acid tells me what kind of sugar is found in, in RNA. Nucleic acid tells me what kind of macromolecule it is. So literally the name lends itself to what the actual structure is. Same thing for DNA. It is made up of monomers, so this is a polymer, and the, names, the name of nucleic acid monomers are called nucleotides. So nucleotides make nucleic acids. Okay, so let's look at our nucleotides. The nucleotides come in three parts, and hopefully you remember this. A five-carbon sugar, one of four nitrogen bases, and a phosphate group. So let's review. The nitrogen bases come in four types or four varieties when we're talking about, about DNA, and those would be adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. When we're talking about 
RNA, we replace one of the bases, so we do a substitution. There is no thiamine in RNA. Instead, you have the base uracil. The bases adenine, cytosine, and guanine are all kept. Instead of always referring to these by name, we normally just call them A, T, C, G, or U, just depending on which one we're talking about. The pentose sugar, pentose tells you that it's a five-carbon sugar, and there are two kinds. If we're talking about RNA, the sugar is going to be ribose, and this is what ribose looks like right here. And if it is DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. This is deoxyribose right here. The difference between the two is the presence of an oxygen, or of a, of a hydroxyl group, sorry, on the second carbon. So there is an OH group attached to the second carbon on ribose, and there isn't an OH group attached to the second carbon on deoxyribose. So again, the name tells you, deoxy, no oxygen on my ribose. It's pretty much what deoxy means. And of course, the phosphate group looks like all the other phosphate groups we've seen. It is a phosphate double bonded to one oxygen and single bonded to three other oxygens, the overall molecule being negative, make, making it charged. So are nucleic acids charged molecules? Yes, they are. And they're charged primarily because of this phosphate group. The charge on that, by the way, is negative. This becomes important when we talk about how we can use DNA in biotechnology. Okay, so there are two types of nucleotides, and each type will give you a different kind of nitrogen base. So nucleotides can be broken down into purines and pyrimidines. Purines are double-ringed N-based structures. That just means that instead of having lots of carbon in their, their ringed structures, they also have some nitrogens. So like here, nitrogen, 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 nitrogen. Now, only two of our bases fall under the category of purines, and those would be adenine and guanine. So the way that I remember it is pure silver, so pure for purine, and AG is, excuse me, the chemical formula for the element silver. The other group, or the other type of nucleotides are called pyrimidines, and they are single-based, again, nitrogen structures. So they're single-ringed nitrogen structures. Um, and there are three of them. Cytosine, thiamine, and uracil are all pyrimidines. So the main difference between the two, purines are double rings, and pyrimidines are single rings. Another way you could remember this is the word purine is short, but their structure is big. And the word pyrimidine is big, but their structure is small. It's kind of the opposite of what it, you would think it would be naturally. So again, purines are AG, and pyrimidines are C, T, and U. Now, really quick before I move on, let's compare our purines. If you look at the actual structure, you should notice there are really only a couple of differences between adenine and guanine. This functional group versus that functional group. And then here is an additional functional group on guanine that adenine doesn't have. And then there's some places where we're missing some hydrogens. So like here, we're missing a hydrogen. Here we're missing a hydrogen. But for the most part, it's the same structure. We just change the functional groups. Look at the pyrimidines, same thing. It's the same base structure. We've just pretty much changed the functional groups. Okay, so like I told you, nucleic acids are polymers and they're arranged in a very specific and special way. There is one section of the molecule that's almost like a backbone. It's like, it's like made up of, of quote-unquote bones, but they're really just um, sugars and phosphates. But they go in a very specific order, almost like a ladder. So the backbone is comprised of your sugar molecule, which is the green molecules here, 
and then your phosphate groups, which are these little tiny yellow dots on the picture. And it always alternates. So it is, sorry, it is phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, all the way down. So the entire backbone is just made up of your sugars and your phosphates. These are held together, and I've circled right here, 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 and here, by special bonds called phosphodiester bonds. So again, the bonds that hold nucleic acids together are called phosphodiester bonds. And it pretty much allows for that very specific arrangement of your sugars and your phosphates. Now notice that the bases themselves are actually attached to the sugars. So here's a purine, here's a pyrimidine, here's another pyrimidine, another pyrimidine, another pyrimidine, another purine. But they're all attached to this green molecule, which represents your sugar molecule. So the only place that the bases can be added on is to the free end of a sugar molecule, either a ribose sugar or a deoxyribose sugar. Because of this, it forces our polymer to grow in only one direction. We can only add bases and nucleotides, for that matter, on in one direction. Now, note how these nitrogen bases are hanging off of our backbone. So they're kind of sticking out into the middle. We call these dangling bases. And this is highly important because it creates the atmosphere needed for hydrogen bonding to take place, which is how the double helix of DNA holds itself together. So our nucleotides are going to bond between our DNA strands. And they're held together by hydrogen bonding, which is what is shown here and here. And it's always going to be a purine bonded to a pyrimidine. Two purines can't bond to each other just like two pyrimidines can't bond to each other because it changes the whole dynamic of the molecule and it makes it unstable. Now, A's or adenine, sorry, always bond with diamines or T's. And only two hydrogen bonds holds them in place. Whereas C's always bond with keep doing that wrong, sorry, C's always bond with G's, and three hydrogen bonds hold them in place. So our double helix is pretty much held together by hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding holds the two sets of bases together thereby joining our two strands in place. So like we said before, A and T and C and G. But we know for a fact that hydrogen bonds are really weak. So why is the most important macromolecule in our bodies being held together by such weak bonds? Well, that same macromolecule has to be able to replicate. It has to be able to make copies of itself. And in some situations, it has to be able to be transcribed. You have to be able to pass on the message that that section of DNA is carrying so that we can eventually make a protein from it. If they were all held together by covalent bonds, it would take a ridiculous amount of energy to always be breaking those bonds so that we would have access to the important bits, which are our bases. Hydrogen bonds can easily be broken, opening up the molecule where we need it to be opened up, but they can just as easily be reformed, closing the molecule back up into place. Now you will notice on the picture that there are two sections of the DNA, and we, I have some measurement, me, measurements sorry, next to them. So we have a section here, and we have a section here. You would also notice that this region is one full twist, and it's bigger than this region, which is the space in between each individual twists. You'd also know that I have a measurement that tells you the distance from one base to another base. This big region is called the major groove. Which means that the smaller region, my handwriting has not really improved, is called the minor groove.
<clears throat> now, I'll get in when we do the actual DNA. I'll get more in depth with why we have them and what they're used for. But just know that they're used for binding sites for different proteins and different transcription and translation factors. We'll talk about exactly what those are later on. Okay, so when DNA gets copied, it's the process is called DNA replication. And we're going to form two strands of the DNA double helix that are going to be complementary to one another. Okay, so if you have one, you can build another one from it, or if you have one, you can rebuild the entire from it. This is why it's so important that we have these matching halves, that C only aligns with G, and that A only aligns with T in DNA. It's a real good, almost foolproof system where we can always remake the DNA that we need. Okay, so when does a cell copy its DNA? Well, cells will copy through in, in two very specific areas within their life cycle. Through a process called mitosis, which is all about cell-to-cell -cell reproduction, so we're just making copies of a cell that we already have, and through a process called meiosis, where the whole point is to produce a sex cell or a gamete, so either an egg cell or a sperm cell. So that's when your cell, and also how your cell, is going to do a lot of its copying, mitosis and meiosis. So, let's talk about who kind of discovered DNA, and this is highly controversial, and I'm highly passionate about this, so excuse me if I get emotional. Here we go. Everyone credits the discovery of DNA to a two-band team known as James Watson and Francis Crick. By the way, Watson was American. They're both molecular biologists, and while they both did lots of phenomenal work in the field of DNA. It's, it's always credited to just the two of them, and there are a whole lot more people involved than just those two. So let's kind of step through that. <clears throat> so this is the original, like the actual first model of DNA, true 3D DNA ever built. And it was done by Watson and Crick in 1953. At the time, both of them were PhD students um, in England. Now, they came up with the structure, like they were the ones who figured out how all the pieces fit together and how those pieces lent itself to the creation of this double helix, but they weren't the first ones to come up with the concept of DNA. They weren't even the ones who discovered that DNA was a double helix. There were a whole lot more people involved. Okay, so there enters the man, Maurice Wilkins. He had been working with DNA forever, and he had come up with a lot of information on what DNA was and how it functioned, and maybe even some of the parts and pieces. There are people like Shargaroff who figured out that we had A's and T's and C's and G's, and that they paired up in a very definitive way with a definite ratio. Um, they didn't get a whole lot of credit for their work. Later on, you know, after they had died, they kind of received some credit, but while they were still around, no one ever credited them with any of their discoveries, at least not to the scale that they needed to be credited. And then, of course, this is my favorite because, you know, call me feminist. Um, Rosalind Franklin was a biophysicist and molecular biologist, and her field of expertise was X-ray crystallography. It's because of work that she did, and this is some of her original work, that Watson and Crick were even able to build their model. She was the first one to really suggest that DNA may have alternative forms. And now we know that DNA actually has three forms, A form, B form, and what we call Z form. The form that we are most familiar with and the form that DNA tends to exist in for the longest period of time is B form. And that's the, that's the form of DNA that Crick and Watson actually built with their model, but they did it based on her X-ray crystallography. The first time they tried to put their model together, they had it backwards, and they had the sugars facing the inside and the bases facing the outside, and she came in and she suggested, yeah, this, this doesn't look right. I know for a fact that it, it really should go the other way. Um, there was a lot of 
hatred, not so much on Crick's part, but especially Watson. He could not stand Franklin with, you know, he can stand the best bone in her body. And I think it really irritated him that she was female and she was right because their initial structure was completely off base. He also felt like a lot of the work she did would support the work he and Watson was doing, but he and Crick were doing, sorry, but they weren't willing to give her any credit for it, so she chose not to share a lot of her work with them, even though in the end, because of how many papers she published and how many speeches she gave, they still used tons of her information to come up with their final model, but they never really gave her any credit for it. Okay, so like you already know, there is a definitive ratio of A to T and C to G, and it affects the stability of your DNA molecule. How many A's and T's you have, or two bonded um, nitrogen bases, versus how many three bonded nitrogen bases you have. <clears throat> now, it is a known fact that the more guanines and cytosines you have, the stronger that molecule tends to be. I mean, that makes sense. Three bonds are going to be stronger than two bonds. So when it comes to separating our DNA out, we're going to need higher temperatures or lower pHs or something to actually force those bonds to break. Excuse me. So this can be a really good thing. For organisms that have to exist in really high and elevated temperatures, think of, excuse me, think of some of our prokaryotes that like extreme conditions then like our thermophiles, for example, they're going to have to have DNA that's fairly resistant to those temperature changes. And the way they do it is they place a whole lot more C's and G's in their double helix than they place A's and T's. For a strange reason, parasites have many, many A's and T's versus C's and G's. We don't really know why, and I don't study parasites, so I can't really help you with that. Here's something else that's interesting to note. The monomers that make up DNA and RNA are pretty much the same monomers that make up ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So the A should give you a suggestion as to which, which, um, sorry, <laughs> the A should give you a suggestion as to which of our nucleotides, or which of our nitrogen bases, I should say, we're going to use to make ATP. It's going to be adenine from the adenosine. Um, and then all we do to make it ATP is we throw on two more phosphate groups. So ATP, three phosphates using the base adenine and the same ribose sugar that we would use in DNA. So we call this a modified nucleotide. Now every time you remove or add on a phosphate group, you change the identity of this particular modified nucleotide. So when you only have one phosphate, it's AMP, or adenine monophosphate. When you have two, it's ADP, or adenine diphosphate. And of course, when you have three, it's ATP, adenine triphosphate. And adenine is not the only energy molecule we can use. Now, we always consider ATP to be just energy and it's the only form that your body has energy in, but that's not true. You can form energy molecules, so modified nucleotides, with any of the nitrogen bases. So there's ATP, there's TTP, CTP, GTP. Right? I just like this picture because I think it's the coolest thing ever, but yeah. So, we're now at the end of our macromolecules unit, so let's sum up. We're going to go through a quick review of the four major types and just some of the, the more important things I think you need to remember. So here we go. You don't necessarily have to take notes at this point, just kind of listen. So the first macromolecules that we talked about were our carbohydrates. We said that they're made of monomers, and those monomers are called monosaccharides, which stands for one sugar. Their job is to provide short-term energy for your body, to be used as raw materials, to be used as energy storage, and also to be used as structural components in various cells. Some of our common examples are going to be glucose, starch, cellulose, glycogen, 
and chitin. They're formed through a process called dehydration synthesis, also known as a condensation reaction, and the resulting bond that holds them together is called a glycosidic bond. And those are our carbs. Okay, the next one are our lipids. Now, they don't have a monomer, but instead there are certain units that you will always find, or certain structures that you will always find in a lipid. They tend to have glycerols, which are alcohols. They tend to have a fatty acid of some kind. Some of them are long, some of them are small. They, have, they form cholesterols, and characteristically, they always have long hydrocarbon chains. Their job is to store energy, more of a long-term storage function. Um, they help to form membranes, and they also make hormones. Common examples are fats, phospholipids, and steroids. They, too, are formed by the same dehydration synthesis or condensation reaction, and the resulting bond, which is located here, here, and here in fats, are called ester bonds. Next are proteins. They do have a monomer. Their monomers are called amino acids, and in terms of structure, they're the first macromolecule that has levels of actual structure. So they're 3D, truly 3, 3D, sorry, truly three-dimensional molecules. They function in pretty much anything and everything you can think of in your body, from speeding up, and <clears throat> speeding up reactions in the form of enzymes to transporting, transporting and carrying things around to acting as signal molecules to helping with your defense in the form of antibodies to, help to, the, to um, helping with actual structural components and acting as receptors. Examples would be some of our digestive enzymes, um, proteins that are found within your actual cell membrane called membrane channels, and insulin and actin fibers, which are found in your actual muscles, and they help with movement. <clears throat> your amino acid has a very classic arrangement of nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, and that unit is repeated over and over again. Again, they are formed by dehydration synthesis reactions and the resulting bond, which always takes place between your last carbon, the carbon that's part of your carboxyl group, and the nitrogen that's part of your amino group, is called a peptide bond. And then, of course, nucleic acids, which we just covered. Their monomers are nucleotides. Their function is purely informational. It's all about storing information or transferring information. There are only two examples, DNA and RNA. They too, I didn't talk about this, but they too are formed by dehydration synthesis and the resulting bond is called a phosphodiester bond and it connects between, <coughs> excuse me, the sugar molecule and the phosphate molecule right there. They have um, four types of bases if we're talking about DNA and there are thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. If we're talking about RNA, there is no thymine. Instead, there is the base uracil. Okay, uh, ghost of lectures, Patty, if there is anything interesting. This is just all about building the polymer. We talked about it. This is just talking about where different things attach. So the sugar is in the middle, the base hangs off in the center, and the phosphate group sticks out to the side. And the same arrangement of sugar phosphate backbone and then bases sticking out in the middle. Again, it shows you pictures of pyrimidines. Your pyrimidines are going to be cytosine, thiamine, and uracil. They're only one ring. And your purines, remember I told you, remember pure silver, pure for purines, and AG for silver, A being adenine and G being guanine. <clears throat> okay, RNA is just a single nucleotide chain. Some people call it a single helix, but it, it alters its shape so much that I actually don't call it that. DNA, on the other hand, is going to be a double nucleic chain, and we have nitrogen bases that bond in pairs, and that happens in the middle of the actual molecule. It spirals out into a double helix, and its structure was first proposed in 1953 by Watson and Crick, um, with the help of lots and lots and lots of other people, including Maurice Wilkins and my favorite, Rosalind Franklin. <clears throat> okay, um, 
Like we said before, this is all about information, so it carries all of the bases necessary for our blueprint, for all of our instruction. It can pass that information on from parent to child, and we have to do that by making copies of it, and that information is stored in the form of genes. And that's it. You're done. So after this, all we have left to talk about under the biochemistry umbrella would be enzymes, which are fun and gives free energy. Not as much fun, but we'll make it work. See you guys soon. Bye.